Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, buddies. Thanks for tuning in so I can help you tune up. I'm just watching Shannon's face over there as we go from, oh, my gosh, it's so serious to, oh, we're in the land of under the hood. I looked over at Russ, and for some reason, he has a paper airplane stuck in his in his thing. And I'm getting ready to fly this afternoon, and that plane almost looks like it's crashing. And for some reason, I found that funny. It flies incredibly well. It does. Did it get stuck right there? No, that it it could have. I bet. Yeah, that was the last week. You missed a whole bunch of. I. How long has that been there? Just a week. It was last week that we maybe a couple years. Yeah. It's a good couple of years. <laughs> no, I. I just I'm, didn't know I'm it was... typically fairly attentive to what's going on around me. Not always. Not always. The 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 uh, the industry friends of mine had a mistake at the trade conference we were just at, and I was the butt of a joke that everybody else was laughing. I couldn't figure out, but that's a whole other story <laughs> for another moment. But uh, <laughs> no, sorry for that unprofessional beginning. I looked over and I saw a paper airplane. I'm thinking my wife and I are rushing to uh, head out of town right after the show, and we're getting on a, an airline that I haven't flown on for a while. And then Russ has got an airplane stuck right there, <laughs> right in the middle of his microphone. Well, I'd be more concerned about the other one you're not flying on. It normally <laughs> goes that direction because then you might look like it looks like an arrow on the camera's pointed right oh, to yeah, Chris. Is what it does. Look it's like that. looks like a fake. Looks like the. Cursor on the computer. Well, my wife and I are heading off to the Bronco Off Rodeo, and so okay. we'll be getting some pictures posted up and, and a little, little bit of video. We'll talk about that. So fight. let's come back. To We're that. doing that too. Let's oh. come back to that because I yeah. do want to talk about that. Yeah, this is kind of cool. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Let's go to Arizona and talk to Nate. You're on the Under the Hood Show, Nate. What can we do for you? Hey, good morning. Um, I have a No. Seven uh, Jeep Liberty. Got. Uh, 225,000 miles on it. And um, there's been, you know, talk over there. I'm pretty regular listening to the show. So I pretty much know the advice on the transmission uh, with, you know, this stage in its life. But uh, so when it does go kaput finally and I have it rebuilt because I really love the Jeep. I want to do a lot of some things to it. This one's been really good. The motor's still pretty strong. So when I redo the transmission, uh, obviously there's no dipstick and you can't check the fluid on this one. And from what I've read and heard you guys say, it's kind of a sealed deal. The last owner didn't do any of the, the fluid. He read that it was okay just to, just to, or it, it was probably better just to let it go instead of do the intervals because of the, you know, different things. But so basically when it's, rebuilt and put back together to should I just keep up with the 30,000 miles or whatever the interval is that way and just have it done or just let it go. I I think you should change it. It's, I think it's going to be a little more than 30,000 on that. I think it's probably, it's fully synthetic in there. It's probably somewhere around 60. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, it's, it's already done, so you can't really say what he should have done, but I, I think that changing it probably would have helped. But, on the other hand, we we get a we kind of see the temperature of the market with all the cars that are coming through here. So we have a, a you know a large auto recycling business in the terms of you know we got a lot of stuff moving through here. So we get those phone calls every day. I need a transmission. We get those calls about yours a lot earlier than almost three hundred thousand miles. So if you've got that many miles on it and it's never been changed. I think you did great. I, I think you won. Yeah, you saved you saved the money of having to do the maintenance yeah. on it, and you made it as long. So part of it's that Arizona climate you're in. 
uh, you're not getting so much moisture in that transmission fluid. Uh, part of it could be the way you're driving it, um, you know, all, all sorts of things. But, yeah, we would definitely inspect the fluid at, say, 50,000, 60,000 miles. And if it looks like it's changing a little bit, you could change it out, you know, change that fluid out. But if it still looks good, you might be able to go a little longer on it. And it's just got a bolt in the bottom of the trans you take out in order to get in there and see what's going yeah, on. A second. And I haven't had it that long, so I got it. You know, I got it well, and I got it at two hundred and twenty thousand miles or something like that. So, and I only paid fifteen hundred bucks for it. That's kind of the why I went ahead and it, did the deal on it because sure. I knew it had a really good history on it. And you know, but so I didn't even I haven't bothered with the fluid just because again I I think at this point it's never been done or it hasn't been done in over a hundred thousand. So. I'm, I'm sure your advice would be just believe it now until it does finally go out. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Maybe I missed. May, maybe I missed the point at the beginning of the call, but it's not. It's working good now. It sounds like then, right? Yeah, yeah, leave, yeah it is still it working fine. But yeah. at some point, it's going to go yeah. out. I imagine because there's a little bit of slippage here and there, but not a whole. And maybe that's just the deep transmission. I don't know. It, it hits a little hard on some of the beginning gears. Let but it let it be with that kind of miles on. Just let it be, and when you do have to get to the <laughs> sure. point where you're either buying a reman tranny or you're having a, a quality transmission shop rebuild that transmission, they're going to also do some updates to it based on what the industry has learned about that transmission. If they've if they, if they're anything worth their salt, they're going to give you the latest component kit that goes into that that would have the updated. I don't know what it is, but let's just say it's a valve block that goes yeah. inside of the they the updated, or maybe it's a a piston that they found they needed to make out of a different material or or it's a clutch pack that's got another mill of thickness to it or, or or whatever that might be seals that are made out of a different kind of material that's all the stuff they learn over time and you're going to get all that and then i think russ just he gives you good advice with all the good fluids they use now and everything you do you're you're uh the re, either the remanufacturer or the shop is going to give you a maintenance agreement to uh, of what they say you should do and just follow that. And it's going to be in that range that he told you. Mm -hmm. Thank Nate, you very much. Thanks very much for the call, Nate. I appreciate it. Thank you. Now, when you, you guys have said this before when we're talking about, like, so you can't check the fluid there except to drain it. Not with a dipstick. Right. You've got a, you've got a bolt in the bottom. You know, I, do I, do I, I admit, here's what I would do. I'd unscrew the bolt and then I would try and quick put my finger there. And check what's on the bolt and on my hand. Well, you could just lo loosen it up enough and see if it starts to drip out just a little bit. It's not going to pour oh, out, yeah. but when it's warmer, <laughs> you it don't will. have to go to that oh, degree yeah. of difficulty. Because then I was going to try don't and shove break it, the dam, shove yeah. it back in, no, and just tip over the edge of it and put your so toe in. How these things work is uh, there is a imagine a uh, um, it's it's like a fountain. When you see a fountain and there, the water fills up to the top of it, and then it spills over the little pipe in the middle. That's mm -hmm. how that works, Chris. So if you took a, if you if you took your kitchen sink full of water, and it's um, you know a couple inches from the top, if you keep filling it, it's going to overflow. Well, if you drilled a little hole in the bottom of the sink and then just took a piece of pipe and shoved it up through the bottom of it, and it was nice and sealed, and you had the top of that pipe two inches below the top, as when the water got full, mm -hmm. it would dump over. Well, that's how you check this. There's a bolt in the bottom of that pipe. You take it out, and if nothing comes out, you need to add a little bit of fluid through that pipe. And once it, you know, okay. fills it and then stops running back out, you know you're full. But they want you to check it at a specific temperature because that fluid will rise and fall with the temperature. It's So my tricky. question is on this and on the oil, or when we specifically, I guess, when we're talking about the oil changing the filter but not the oil, do you just let it drain out and pour it back in? Is that what I'm doing? Is that how I'm doing that? Well, in some situations, they have a dump and fill procedure, basically. Okay. Yeah, they'll have a drain. You drain it. You Just pull. Like there's two one. bolts. You pull a little bolt out of the middle of it to drain, to check it, but then you pull the whole thing out to drain it, which comes with the pipe and everything, mm -hmm. and it'll it'll drain. But most people aren't drain and fill. They're going to flush it out and right. use a flush machine, and it's going to take out what it puts back in. It's it measures that. So it knows how to do it. But they've, they've, the manufacturers made it a little tricky for you and try to tell you that it'll last forever. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. This is the Under the Hood Show. 
Be sure to visit our website for news, contests, and previous shows at underthehoodshow.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to get back under the hood with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Illinois and talk to Mark. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Mark, what can we do for you? I have a 2013 Ford Escape that is slowly trying to kill my wife. And she like to fix. <laughs> that is not good. Mark, are you on speakerphone? Can you, is there a way for you to? I am. Okay. Legally, I cannot. I'm, I'm okay. driving. So All right, keep going. Keep going. Um, we have an ex- exhaust getting into the ca- uh, passenger compartment of the car. After having the exhaust system checked and other checks done, we cannot find anything at this point that is causing that, and I need ID. Why? Okay, this is going to sound like a stupid question, but why do you think there's exhaust getting into the cabin? Well, after driving it the other day, she ended up in the emergency I think that's, that's a, a good, good indication. I think we got a great indication. There you go. <laughs> so I feel stupid. Like uh, I said, it's, it's trying to kill her. Wow. That would not be a good thing. That's a big, that's a big leak then because it, you can get the smell from other cars when you're in yeah, traffic. Yeah, that's what I was trying to get at. Mm-hmm. I was thinking this was a more minor deal. but this Pulled like in, a, but if you've got it that heavy, there, there, there's definitely an exhaust leak. First of all, and, and this is not a joke, but you can go buy... A carbon monoxide detector, same as you get at home with the battery that beeps and everything, and put it in your car for, it's it, it's not a solution by any means, but it keeps this from happening again. It'll tell you if you have a leak, that's right. for sure. And we've we've had to do that with some cars where people have said, I'm positive I have a leak, and we're positive they don't. But to find a leak, what, what we often do, if we can't hear it, we can't smell it, and can't quite find it, but we're pretty sure there is one. We will bring it in the shop, and we will stuff a rag over the end of the exhaust, and I'll hold it there while somebody is listening up front with a stethoscope or just putting their ear to it and listening to try to find it because sometimes that leak can be big enough to cause a problem but small enough that you won't hear it under normal conditions you, with the, the belt noise and the fan noise and just the engine running noise is enough to cover up that exhaust leak. But when you're going down the road, right. it comes out of a manifold leak, gets pulled into the cabin air filter through the front of the vehicle, and you smell it inside. And that's probably what's happening is it's leaking under the hood only under certain conditions of driving, load, temperature, all that stuff. So we're going to want to find out where that's at. And I would say that our suggestion is to you know, cover up that exhaust and see if we've got a, a leak up front. You should hear it. It'll put a lot of pressure on back there. Uh, the motor might even slow down in is some that, cases. Is that that little EcoBoost turbo motor in that one? It is. Okay. And, you know, we, we put it on the rack, and we've had it, uh, I mean, just gone over the whole thing, and, and we can't feel anything. We, you know, and obviously we can't hear it, so... We've had a few of those leak at the flange where the turbo connects to the downpipe on those. Um, Not one like this where somebody's had the smell but not heard it. But we have heard it leaking there on several of them, so it's very possible that that's where it's beginning to leak. And you definitely don't want to let that go. I would, you know, maybe go. you can go to the same shop or try another one but say, hey, can we just, like, stick a plug over the exhaust while, you know, when it's running and have somebody listen on the other end and see if we can hear this thing making an air noise up front. You can't leave it there forever, but, um, you know, it gets pretty hot back there, but you can, we, we take a rag and put our heat glove on and cover it up and just for Hopefully long in 30 enough to seconds hear it. to a minute, you can figure out what's going well, on. Well, it won't even go that long. It'll usually go, you know, five, 10 seconds at a time. And then we have to let the pressure off and try it again. But in that period, we can listen up front and hear where that thing's leaking. There is a certain class of vehicle in our home market that has, uh, if you see this class of vehicle out on the road, it's a, it's a, a business vehicle, 
in the vehicle, you will see the first alert carbon monoxide detectors in the car. They have them visible to the driver. Oh, so they put like a like a like a courier regular, service type thing, right? Yes. Similar. Yeah, but Similar, I didn't know driving, they had that. Driving modified Fords in an official capacity. Well, you know what? If you can... Uh, you don't have to be coy about it. There was a national recall on Ford Explorer police vehicles. Our police force yeah, in the, and, our home market yeah, has so them, the, or they, at least did a year they ago. They had a big issue with them, and they were trying that. to figure that out. They and have I, home detectors in the cab. I think that, that was an approach that a lot of PDs took um, to try to protect their staff until they could figure out what was going on and why it was happening. We have had cars come in. Diesels are worse because you don't, you, you don't get the feeling until it's really too late. That diesel exhaust, you know, you know we had, that, had to put those detectors in our building exactly. back here. Exactly that are different than the regular detectors. Exactly. And they'll get to you. But we've had people come in with leaky. Diesels tend to leak more than gasoline trucks and cars. And these trucks will come in, and the the underside of the dash will be black on some of the older diesels because they've leaked and gotten into the cab, and people don't realize <laughs> that's that's all that exhaust coming in. You're breathing that stuff. That stuff's nasty. Mark, thanks very much for the call. Good luck finding that. But, yeah, uh Get a detector in there that because right away. Most people know this from hundreds of years of commercials, but maybe they don't. But the carbon monoxide is is odorless. And, and mm-hmm. you know, if it happens to be mixed up with some hydrocarbons that are coming out of the exhaust that you can still smell, that's your bonus to be able to actually smell it. That's why you're smelling it is because the other right. Unburned. Otherwise, you know, there's that carbon monoxide stuff. That's the problem. You just mm-hmm. doesn't it overtakes you. And you just takes over your blood system and you just can't smell it. Eight six six five nine four. Four one five zero. We got another Mark. Mark, you're on the Under the Hood show. What can we do for you? Hey, I got a uh, 2012 uh, Ford F350 with a 67 diesel, and I got the battery light on on the dash, and it it, it has the two alternators, and uh, we have. I mean, we disconnected the battery, load tested them, they checked okay. And then we also checked after we fired it up, and the alternator was put out. We read 14, like 7 volts when it was running. So anyway, I didn't know what to look for. You got double the trouble. You've got two <laughs> computer-controlled alternators, and you've got, uh, uh, well, and it's double everything. So you've, you've got to go through their the factory test procedures in that of, of finding out, you know, check each one individually, see what the voltage is. If it's overcharging or undercharging, it will give you that code or the light. Either one will do that. If you read it with a scanner, you might get some codes for it. You might have a computer control issue where it can't quite read the charging system properly. Could even have something as basic as a bad battery. Uh, the, the batteries on that are very important. They They both have to be matched. Same cranking amps, same battery. You replace them in pairs. You don't ever do just one battery. Um, yeah. You know, but check the batteries because we've had a couple of them come in where the batteries, one of them's got a problem and a fault in it, short inside of it, and it's causing an issue with the other and giving you a charging light. And any wiring along the way can be an issue. Those are, they can be tricky. Have you tried to look at it with a scanner to see if there's any kind of data or codes in there for the charging system? No. No, I haven't yet with that. I would do that because that 12 definitely has the ability to do some checking on that, and it might it might just give you a glaring fault of exactly what's wrong with it, which would be great. You know, if it says alternator A, um, field circuit short, it's like, oh, great. That's easy to, to, to go and diagnose. But if it just gives you a, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really ever say that, does it? No. Oh. No, if we ever have a scanner that we plug in and it says, I don't know. I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm gonna retire. <laughs> but sometimes that's the value of the data you get. Is I don't know because it's telling you go look yeah. at this. Sometimes no fault, but it's great if it does. If it gives you something, but, but I for, think it will. But for the thing for him to really know is that check the basics. Mm-hmm. You know, battery, Batteries cabling, sure. ends. Make sure there's no corrosion. Nothing weird going on from the alternator to the batteries down to the starter. Check it all. And then understand that the good old days of just checking voltage and output are gone. Um, you've got a sequence you have to go through. There's a pulse width modulated regulator that's controlled by the computer. Um, and so any little 
fault in an, in an alternator or related components along the path, or even sometimes a, it can be in the computer, can cause that type of problem where it's still working, still charging the battery, still doing everything it should, but it's telling you, eh, I don't like this. And then, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and, you're, and then you're saying, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, good luck. Thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. 866-594-4150. From the autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe to our, our YouTube channel... And you join the Hoodie Fan Club at underthehoodshow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Karen Killingsworth, who listens to us in Cedartown, Georgia. Congratulations from all of us under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. Time to get into that automotive career. Mm -hmm. That's what we should do. I should get into the automotive field. I should go to Universal Technical Institute, get trained on all the latest stuff, and then I could work in a shop. Wait a second. Oh, that's, I'm thinking, I'm going back to the past, thinking that's you know, what I, you should have done. Should have done that. You, I could have learned all sorts of stuff. That you could go to UTI and be a teacher. Took, took me years of hands on training to learn. You know, I could have could have learned it faster and then got in there. I mean, you, book smart is one thing, but shop smart is another thing. But still, you don't get a good book smart and a hands on like this to get your career kicked off. You're not going anywhere fast. You might go somewhere, but it may take a lot longer. And they and, got so many neat things you can do there. And, oh, and one yeah. of the things they do, they've got a, a connection to NASCAR also. Mm -hmm. And the people that have gotten into that little realm have got to be having so much fun right now because they're they're really putting the hardcore testing to this next generation mm -hmm. car uh, that's out there. And they've been at these different tracks and just trying to beat the crud out of this thing to figure out what they got to learn. They're they're right down to moving the spoiler up and down an inch to looking at the vents in the quarter windows and how it affects the rear traction. But there's guys I'm sure that Doesn't have been that through sound, yeah. that have been through that UTI NASCAR program that are probably highly involved with some of this stuff that they're doing right now. I don't know that for sure. We got to run that really thing chance. ten laps, Shannon. You want to take it out for ten laps? Yeah, I think I can do it. Yeah, I could do that. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. They got to practice fixing one the other day. Austin Dillon piled one up in in uh, <laughs> in the, the uh, test session. So they got to see how the the new front clipping procedure how, works because they did. They they also made the car easier to repair. Was one of the things. I mean, they've got. We saw one of the cars at uh, Poet when we were over there. They had one sitting there, and a lot of different stuff on it. It's just it'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see. Uh, I've I totally I segued here, but like Alex Bowman, they were interviewing him, and of course, uh, um, who was it? They gave him static for being. He made his own T-shirts. They said he was. Uh, Basically saying he wasn't a skilled driver. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I can't remember what it was yeah. that he said about him, and, and he made T-shirts out of it. But, oh, gosh, I can't. Well, I, well, I can't remember. But anyway, but he's just said this new, this new car is going to put the driver so much more back into it, which everybody should be okay with because I like that. Let's talk to Denny. Denny, you're on the End of the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Uh, well, I just asked actually some questions about this 74 Civic Caprice. Classic, I bought it in 1974. It only had uh, 500 demonstrator miles on it. And it would take a tank of gas. Or for every tank of gas, it would take a quart of oil at a 454 engine. And the uh, pocket traction, I, there's no way to get it out. So when I want to turn a corner on a slippery snow or icy street, I'd have to put it in the neutral to turn it. Otherwise, it'd want to go straight ahead. And uh, the uh, mechanical fuel pump, I, uh, I had to replace that a couple times. And a lot of times, I was on the road for a major feed company, and I was on the road every day, and I would shut the ignition off, and it would want to keep running. It wouldn't stop for about a few minutes. And uh, just stuff like that. It was a beautiful car. It had uh, luxurious velvet upholstery, black, and it was a maroon with a, a uh, one of those uh, padded tops on it. 
Where's the car? Where's the car at today? What's the what's where's the car at today? What are you what are you thinking about uh, that we we could probably help you with? I don't have any idea. Uh, my stepson uh, had erected, so I sold it, and uh, the guy that bought it, he he come to look at it. He wanted to know if it had a four bolt main or two bolt. And I didn't know if a four bolt main from a four stop sign on Main Street. <laughs> My uh, my mom and dad had an old Chevy that was one of their first new cars, and it was a uh, a big block car. And their fuel pump literally fell off the car. It was a it was a it was a lemon, and it, it literally they ended up selling it because so many things happened to this car in the first six months that they owned it. But their their fuel pump literally fell off the the car. That seems bad. Yeah, and and uh, I've seen a couple of those old block mounted fuel pumps. Come off. Usually starts with an oil leak and a clatter, and then it's not running right. And you look and go, "Oh, hey, the one of the bolts popped out and <laughs> yeah. broke the ear off the other side." But that seventy four Caprice with a big block on it, if it was still in good shape and around, those oh. cars are climbing the ladder in value, um, just like crazy. Especially if it's a two door, right? You know, they're just climbing the ladder in value, and and there's a following. It's it's good memories. All right, we got to guess what color it is. I th- I think it was that goldish, bronze gold color. Chris? I think, oh, Chris, you're next. I'm going to go a dark color. I'm going to go, I'm going navy blue. I'm thinking it was black. Danny, what color was the Caprice? It was a maroon with a black top. Maroon with a black top. Was All it right. two-door or four-door? Four-door. Four-door. Four door. But All a big right. block and a posi track in the yep, back. That would fun. still be a collector. Sleeper car. A Berkeley One class. And he was out selling seed corn in a hurry. Denny, thanks very much for the call. <laughs> 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Zach in Missouri. Zach, you're on the End of the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Well, it's kind of a follow-up, guys. I always appreciate a happy ending to a story, so I hope you do, too. Oh, yeah. I called in a while. Mazda CX-7 that just like to randomly not start. I don't know if you remember that. Um, we thought it may have been the remote start system installed from Mazda. So I disconnected everything from the remote start. It would still randomly do it. Didn't matter what time of day, how long I'd been driving. Sometimes would not start, but always started the next day for some reason. So I decided to go with a new starter, and I actually found a small wire lead coming off the side of it with a female connection that has like a speaker wire type connection. The wire was loose, and I guess when it was heating up, it was allowing it to come off, and when it cooled down, it was going back on. I put the wire back on to the starter that was already in there. I have not had one problem since. That's Yay. a cheap way to fix it. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> that's the exciter wire probably going down to the solenoid. And now, that's, now it's called an exciting probably. wire. Yeah, exciting that it runs. A ton that's of money. right. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Very exciting wire. So I, it was just, you know, I looked all over the internet. I called you guys. I couldn't figure it out. So I figured maybe somebody might have that problem and they can try that. We have <laughs> talked on the show a number of times, just not with this situation, but so many things that people can't figure out and they've played parts darts and they've been asking, reading the internet. And when they finally start tearing into it, they find a wiring problem or, or they yeah. move something and you don't know, realize they, fixed a wiring problem right. just by moving stuff around a plug in or a connection <laughs> and they 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 want now, the sat, they want I'll the satisfaction the- of finding a broken something in your case you got that satisfaction yeah. you <laughs> found a broken something i did and it, and it fixed your problem <laughs> awesome i tell you, i tell you what guys too the problem is i'm a i'm a plumber by trade a service plumber right so i fix stuff all the time i enjoy doing it i never start with the easiest thing i always go to the hardest thing in my mind, I'm like, well, it can't be this simple, so i got to find the hardest right. thing, and then I find the easy thing. And I'm, Every time I tell myself I'm going to start with the easiest thing, and I never do. So We're with you there. That's my <laughs> advice today, I guess. Awesome. <laughs> Zach, thanks very much for the call. Yeah, that is it, sometimes when you think, you know you go to the hardest thing first instead of just going through it step by step. Well, and it depends a little bit of what your personality can be, too, mm-hmm. your, your wiring. Some people are more inclined to think the the worst thing's going to happen, and some people are more inclined to be a half, you know, glass mm-hmm. half. Uh, that is a you went all over on the analogies broken. there. <laughs> I was going to do about five at once I in the short so, circuit. Yeah. So basically, it all depends on how you're wearing right. too. <laughs> let's talk about. Let's go back. You were talking about the bron. What is it called? 
the Bronco Off Rodeo. Okay. And for people that have orders in on Broncos, and I said on the show here that my wife and I have had an order in for quite a while on the new full-size Bronco. I call it the full-size Bronco because they also have the Bronco Sport. Did mm-hmm. he tell us this? Yeah. yeah so I, just I telling did. us now. No, that no. he had it? That he had one on order. Yeah, yeah he, he kind of side-eyed it in one day. I, yeah. Was yeah, I like, here? Yeah. Yeah, you were. Yeah. I didn't hear it because yeah. this is all new yeah, to me. So this is we, my surprise face. Yeah, no, so when we sold the Jeep that we had, a Wrangler, which we've talked about on the show, we mm-hmm. that was kind of our, we were eyeballing this. And and so we've had to wait and wait and wait, and we're fine with that. we got plenty of vehicles. We'll be okay. 2026. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what model year they're going to call ours. but uh, A 99. So, so as part of this, they, they offer an experience. you got to pay a little extra to do it, and you can go off to one of four locations. And they have you spend the day with um, people that have uh, helped design the vehicle. Um, oh. They've got some folks that have gotten to be specialists on the vehicle. And they take you off-road and they teach you what they've designed into the vehicle, how it works, show you the capabilities of the vehicle. We're going to be with them for 10 hours is what oh, they wow. got the itinerary lined up for on this, this coming up here. And a friend of ours uh, just got back. Well, he's not back yet, but he did it. It uh, would have been yesterday, and he sent us a note and said it was awesome. It was great. He said, he goes, but bring warm clothes because we're going kind of out to the the uh, uh, Red Rock area in Las Vegas, and he okay. said it, it's cool. He said when they started the day, it was 37 degrees, and oh, when yeah. they ended the day, it was 37 degrees. And so we kind of had in our head that this was going to be a little bit warmer experience. <laughs> yeah. and so we had to change our, our – but it'll, it'll warm up Remember when we've gone to Vegas for the SEMA show? Yep. You know, we'll we'll get up. And typically, the days where it, you could have a seventy-four degree day, but there's been days we were there where it was fifty-five during the middle of the day. So, and you remember those nights? Oh yeah, Brr. yeah, yeah a little chilly. So, we're looking forward to that. Um, we're gonna. I'll I'll get some. They said I've got. I can take pictures and I'll shoot a few YouTube videos and get them up on the page. And and D- is this in relation at all to the delivery of your vehicle or no? Uh, absolutely not. Okay. Um, this is something that they've made available. From the beginning, <laughs> but now they're actually giving some stipends to people that have been waiting uh-huh. to get their vehicles. That Ford has offered some stipends that you can use for. Boy, we, we've gotten a gift in the mail like every two months. We yeah. one time, one day, we all of a sudden we open up. What's this? Oh, it's a hammock from Ford. Why did we get that? And then we started realizing oh, that they're yeah. they're yeah. sending little things to the people that have been waiting longer than stuff they, should. they actually do have. I yeah. wonder if they're I wonder if they're like keeping track. So like they're just. They're just asking. They're gonna watch you and see what your mood is and see what the timing is on trying to get them into the Bronco off rodeo. I don't, I don't think so, because <laughs> no. I actually had to sign up to which one. They were doing it down by Austin, Texas. They were doing it in Las Vegas. They were doing it up uh, in the Northeast somewhere, um, in fall foliage colors areas. And uh, where was the other one at? They had four locations. Oh, you could go out to uh, like the Moab area too okay. and do it. And so. We lined it up with another trip. Uh, we're getting an opportunity to go watch the UFC fights in the Apex, and we're gonna. My wife and I are gonna do that. And how's that sound for my wife's fiftieth birthday yeah, present that sounds, trip? That sounds. You, you would perfect. ask the question, whose birthday it is? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but she wanted it. Yeah. No. She, we're both cool with with the the UFC fights and the uh, Bronco off rodeo experience. So eight six six five nine four four one five zero. We got to take a quick break, then we're going to go to Mississippi next on the Under the Hood Show. 866 594 4150. Make a radio appointment each week to hear the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. 866 594 4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to Mississippi and talk to Tareel. Tareel, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, how you doing? Fantastic. Uh, yeah, I got a, a 19 F-150. I got the V6 turbo, twin turbo, uh, 27. And uh, it, I had a 30,000 miles, I had a misfire, you know, when it get hot, it idle. And uh, I replaced the plugs and everything, and that cleared it up. The uh, plugs, you know, they look perfect. You know, no, no carbon or nothing on it. I know that's a snapshot of it inside the combustion chamber. So is that, is that a good sign that I don't have carbon built up in there? Well, it could have a little bit of carbon building up in there, but the the plugs on those do wear out a lot faster than non-turbo engines. They they want you to change those plugs more often in there, and they can look good, but still have a, a carbon arc inside of them, and 
and cause a misfire. If you pull them out and look, they go, oh, they look like brand new. But if you put a scanner on there, not a plug-in scanner under the dash, but a lab scope type scanner, and you look at the spark pattern of the plugs, you'll see that they're in poor shape. So they just require a little more, uh, more changing, changing more often. How many miles do you have on your 19 F-150? Uh, it's uh, about 33 now. 33,000? Yeah. That's pretty low mileage yeah, to be putting yeah. spark plugs in it, to tell you the truth. You think yeah, I, I had to do it at, at, at 30,000. I had to do it at 30. Yeah. What's the factory recommendation in the in the maintenance guide? That, I think it's 30. Is it that low, Russ? Yeah, there's a few vehicles. Now, this is, this is very important because you've been – it's been beating your head for years for everybody. Oh, we're, we're good for a hundred thousand. Now we used to be, you know, once a year, 12,000 yeah, miles. Exactly. I'm really old, like that. Denny's old caprice, you know, but they've changed and they went to longer. And Chris is like, it's a, you're probably thinking a hundred thousand miles, right? Chris? Well, we've talked about spark plugs. No. You should take out just to make sure they come, they come out. out. Yeah. But there's a lot of vehicles now that are, anywhere from 30,000 to 60,000 that they need to be changed. They want them changed. So you've got to check your owner's manual. Look at these little one liter turbos and things like that. There's a lot of stuff going on in them cylinders and they want those plugs changed more often. So are they still 49 cents at Big Wheel Rossi? No, no they're okay. they're anywhere from uh, <laughs> 11 bucks to $31 a piece for spark plugs now in vehicles and if you're lucky enough to have like a a Ram with a Hemi V8 in it, you get 16 of them. Ooh. Yeah, 16 plugs at $16 a piece. Yeah, that's starts adding up when you get in certain And that's vehicles. where when we talk to people that ask questions about a vehicle and the, the manufacturers have really tried to pretty up the cost of ownership of a vehicle. Right. By saying you don't have to do this, you don't have Extended to do that. Extended maintenance, this yeah. sort of thing. We got better fluids we're using. And some of that is not in the best advice of the second owner of the vehicle. Mm-hmm. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. It, it gets it's great for the first owner of the vehicle. It's great for the warranty period. Uh, it works just fine. You probably don't notice any ill effects. But for that vehicle in the long term, second and third owners maybe may not. I'm just gonna say may not be as good. Right. All right. I so, gotcha. but gosh, yeah, yeah. When you say this, rust me on a 19 F150 with 30,000 miles and he's already changing spark plugs. That just sounds to me on a truck that sounds crazy. Yeah, I think you need to look at the look at the service manual and see what that interval is because it's. On a lot of these, they've gone to a lot lower does service that, interval. Does that help you out there, Terrell? Oh, yeah, yeah. One, one more quick one. Uh, oh, go uh, ahead. I know this uh, when I'm going around in a, in a low-speed you know, situation in the parking lot or whatever. I get a little uh, transmission kind of, kind of, you know, jerks maybe or something. It, it's, not, it's, it's not a problem, but, you know, but it is a problem. But, <laughs> but <laughs> is it, you think it was a reason? Do you think it's a reflash on that? Because I don't, I don't have any issues, you know, just at a low speed sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I kind of like get, get uh, hung up in gears or something, kind of flare, shift flare, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it, uh, might, it might need to be reprogrammed. I've had a couple of them that people have asked about that, but I've driven them and hadn't felt anything. So um, there, there might be something for a reprogram on that. But we don't have a lot of failures on those transmissions. It's. I think we've put one EcoBoost transmission and maybe two. Would that be covered under warranty? If the vehicle's still under warranty, yeah. If you've got an issue, you got to think... keep on them about it unless they can show you, you know, hey, this doesn't know all of them, and it's oh, normal. Right, right, right. Then they should be they should be on that. And you Which wanna... would also make you feel better, Terrell, if you brought it in and they said, oh yeah, that they they do that. It's a little. You drive another one. Yeah. This is kind of how they act sometimes. Yeah. They get confused mm-hmm. in a slow speed shift. And but you need to know because you're you're coming up on that warranty very yeah. quickly. Terrell, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Nebraska and talk to Roman. You're on the end of the hood show, Roman. What can we do for you? Yeah. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I listened to that Saturday. I thought it was like, no, what I was thinking. Oh, that's a long story, but. After my wife passed away this summer, why my insurance guy is going through what money do you need and what do you need to put away and do you need to take money out? And then I was, and we got brought, brought up about my vehicle and I got that. Anyway, I service it all the time and that, but what would be the life expectancy on an engine like that? It's 2006 with 208,000 miles on it. That's, that was all. I was what just type curious. Of, what type of vehicle, Roman? Town and country, I'm guessing. 
It's a Town and Country 2006 okay. 3.8 with 208,000 miles on it. I'm uh, I'm psychic. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell you that your motor's going to last not as long as you want it to. 206, you would say, oh, congrats. A 3.8 right? <laughs> in an 06 town and country at 200,000 miles if it's original. Uh, I'm going to guess, right. I'd be surprised if it doesn't already have a little bit of a clatter to it. Uh, a little bit of upper, oh, vel- a little, a little bit of up- upper valve train noise, or, or is it quiet as can be? It's quiet as can be, and I service it all the time and that, but I just... I, was just, I didn't know whether there was any kind of life expectancy on because I, I got to, you know, where my money situation is on whether I'm going to have to replace a vehicle. I hadn't thought about until we discussed that. What are you going to need for money and all this stuff? Is this vehicle, most of its life, had a lot of highway miles? Is it mainly when you get it out and you drive it a very long way, or is it a bunch of, you had short trips on it, you had it a long time? I... Had it uh, seven years and it was I had a hundred thousand when I got it. And I, mostly it's local travel. I live out in the country, like okay. ten miles, and it's I, that twenty. 20 I would start once. start saving in your budget now for replacement because at some replacement point, vehicle. Yes, right. because at some point you're going to lose either that engine or transmission, and we it's rare that we see one of those come in with over 230,000 miles on it that's still running with the original engine and trans. So the van might be in good shape and you might be able to put another engine or transmission in it. But if you're thinking about a different type of vehicle, something that with a little more fuel economy and a few years newer, now would be the time to start saving. And hopefully by Not the, time, the time to buy. Right. You, you yeah. Hopefully when you get to the point where you've got some of that money saved up, the vehicles have you bet, uh, there's normalized more out there. the market yeah, hopefully there's a little normalized. more out there so hopefully you know I, we don't know when that's going to be it could be six months or three or four years we don't know yet but hopefully it'll be a little better but either way i would start saving in that budget now the, for an engine or transmission or a vehicle the fact that it's running great and all that it could go a year or two or easily. three easily easily you're could. playing you're playing a little bit of roulette with your your vehicle right now at that many miles in that age but not any more than anyone is exactly ever, you really. could go buy another two thousand and 13 something as an upgrade that might have less miles that could surprise you with a repair also. Right. The reality is when you're working with a vehicle that's out of factory warranty and a vehicle that gets some age and miles on it, you should always be somehow having a budget available for repairs with the hope that you never use it. Right. And that budget can become your 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 budget to put the down payment or the purchase of your next vehicle. So that's what we do encourage people to do. Some have went out and bought the extended warranties, and, and uh, many times they can be expensive. And they've gotten a little better that they have programs where you can get reimbursements if you don't use them and things like that. But still, they're, they're using a lot of your money for a long time, even in mm-hmm. that situation. You're better off taking whatever that amount of money is you pay for that warranty, divide it out by 12, and each year, or 24, or whatever it is, the period of right. time, and put that money in the bank. And bank that money for repairs. And if the repairs never come and you just use it for maintenance, you win, and then you use that money to put towards your next vehicle. And it's your money yet all right. the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it stays as yours. Yeah, and it would be not- your money to be tempted with to steal out of your account when you need it for something else that you really think you need. Right. The car's running fine. I should it's, get It's something. your money to be tempted with, which is kind of fun, too. Yeah, that is true. I, I have the budget. <laughs> I have the monthly budget of whatever for repairs, and then I didn't have a repair, so that... I don't need that budget anymore. I can I can use exactly. that. That'll do it for hour one of the Under the Hood Show. Until next time, you can find us at underthehoodshow.com. Hour two is on the way. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturdivance. You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASE engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASE master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. 
Have a great day and remember PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Welcome. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. And we do our best to get you on the air as soon as we can. So Dave, who was calling while we were starting up and has been on hold, we want to get right to him. In North Dakota, Dave, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Yeah, guys, EGM batteries, is the service life worth the extra cost? There's a lot of things about AGM batteries that are worth the extra cost. So, yes, the service life will be longer on AGM batteries. The ability to start a vehicle in the deep cold as compared to a lead-acid battery is much greater. So if you have, if you if you put a, uh, you've got your lead-acid battery and your AGM battery sitting on the ground next to your truck. There's no va- battery in the vehicle, and it's 10 below zero and you throw the lead as a battery in there, it may not start. It may just kind of because it's it's cold. It's not going to go. Then you put the AGM battery in there and fires up. There's a big difference between AGM and lead acid when you start performing in the deep cold. Do you get cold up there in North Dakota at all, Dave? <laughs> no, no. I send that down to you guys. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we get it. We get it deli- <laughs> delivered with a north wind yeah. sometimes. Yes. yes, we've been noticing that over the last few years. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, there's a big difference between those. And then when you have a, a, a very deep cold and you're trying to start a vehicle like that, it's hard on the batteries. It's really stressful inside. And, and the AGM, they've, they are built, they're a stronger battery in there. They last longer. Well, and if you take the other pieces of the, of the, the plus side is this, the internal construction makes them much more resistant to vibration and abuse. Uh, They've tested these things in taxi cabs compared to other flooded acid batteries, and the performance and the life cycle of not shorting out are just incredibly different. Uh, it, it's also recovery time. Uh, if a vehicle has a start-stop technology and those sort of things and all the late model gadgets that are on a car, uh, you're going to find an AGM battery in that vehicle right from the factory mm-hmm. um, for the, the quick turn and performance of that battery. So there, there is a lot of upside to it, uh, and you definitely should consider it. If a guy puts one of those batteries in, like a an old standby generator, do you need a special charger to actually maintain them? Or absolutely not. And fi- ironic that you'd ask that question. Right now, we've got a huge. Shannon just asked me that yeah, question. Yeah, we've got a huge fourteen liter uh, on site generator with a Rolls Royce engine in it. Out of here, we bought it new when we built our our recycling business's new facility, Nordstrom's two point and I. It's time, according to the manufacturer or the service center, to replace the batteries in there because it does a self-test every Wednesday night. We had one time it had to run for about a week because of our nasty winter weather. Power got knocked out, and we were running off our whole business off this standby generator. So I really depend on those batteries. And so they were recommending the battery replacement. Um, they said what they normally put in there. And it was a flooded lead acid. And I said, you know what, I want to check into an AGM. They didn't have one to offer before I have them put their batteries in there. Now, what they've had in there has worked fine for five years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've worked just fine. But I also know that they're under a fair amount of vibration and a fair amount of, uh, of start-stop setting, uh, all these things. And so I, I really know, I know the benefits, and that's what I'd like to put in there. I just haven't got the group size figured out and that stuff yet to be able to check them out. Because they're ginormous. So, yeah, so, <laughs> but I think that would be an excellent application. I have a small um, 18,000 uh, KVW generator at my house. And I put an AGM battery in that as a standby battery uh, when I replaced it from the factory one that came with it. And because I was getting battery trouble codes, I put the AGM battery in there, and I haven't had a trouble code since on a Siemens, a, you know, Siemens generator. All right. I'll take your advice, men. <laughs> Thanks very much for the call, Dave. Talk about a standard car. Let's go with a 
10-year-old Ford Taurus. I need a battery. What's the difference between lead battery, lead acid battery, and an AGM battery cost-wise? May not be as much as you think. That's what I was some, thinking. Cause some they, are very similar. Some are 20 bucks more. <laughs> and I tell you what, uh, Chris, if it's 10 below zero and you go to start your car and it doesn't fire up and I say, Chris, hand me 20 bucks, your car will start. You'd, yeah. be, you'd be forking it over. You'd be like, here, I'll give you 100 bucks if it starts. You know, and you're talking about how many times you're going through that. Or even just a car, you leave the headlights on. You're like, oh, no, I left my headlights on for four hours. Will it start? A lot better chance with a storage capacity, the AGM. And they, they recover so quick. You turn your lights off, maybe it just goes click, click, and doesn't want to really do anything. You let it sit for a little bit. A lot of times they'll recover and still still go. 866-594-4150. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, I just wanted to bring mention to this here. This is a, a local thing that we did, but very nice of the uh, Sioux Falls Corvette Club to bring out uh, – a plaque and give us as a thank you to us as a group. If you're watching the live feed right now, I'm showing it, but uh, this plaque was a thank you for us helping with their uh, Black Hills Classic. Uh, they had the event at the Sioux Empire Fairgrounds, a big event. 50th and, annual. Yeah, huh? and so we were there to help them run their Quick mm-hmm. 60 event and and uh, had a lot of fun with people, and, and uh, it was nice of them to recognize with us. We didn't, we didn't need this or expect this, but... Uh, it's always nice when somebody says thank yeah. you, and, and I just wanted to recognize them them showing their appreciation to, to all of us at the Under the Hood Show for uh, our help uh, with that event. So thank you. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the Quick 60? Now? Yeah, yeah, right now. G- what? Well, talk the, quickly. What are you thinking? T- talk about what it is quick. Tell me, t- Explain oh, what we're talking about. What they have people quickly. do is... What's that? Quickly. Quickly. It's a quick 60. 60 seconds. Okay, I'm under the gun. I can't do it. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, you have a, a starting line with a, with a laser light. Um, you're sitting there still, you got to blast through, uh, this 60 foot course and get stopped within a stop box that they have set up on the other end. Mm -hmm. So it's accelerate, stop as quick as it can. So give you an example that the times are like in the two second range. Right. And so you've got these cars that have got tons of power and the people that usually get this figured out have got the technique down. They've got the power, they got the gearing figured out and it's, you know, you're just, you're planting that car. It, without crossing the line. And uh, and on that night, it's almost all just people in their Corvette stock. There's a few guys that race, and they, that was, they weren't involved in the contest. They were doing it for exhibition, yeah. where they had the, the cars that have won national events and stuff. They're you mm-hmm. know, doing this it's, stuff. That's kind of crazy. funny how how close the times yeah, are getting they are. on the brand new well, cars and the technology. What I was going to say was the first, first time we did it, the race cars were vastly yeah, superior. Oh, yeah. yeah, the leasing years brought out their, yes. their their Corvettes that are custom made right down to the everything uh-huh. uh, that they compete with these cars. They're awesome v- vehicles. The The gap is much smaller now, both in people who've done it and get used to it and the, the cars that are out there. Yeah, so it's fun to watch. I mean, it's something that the enthusiasts of the Corvette can do for the most part without damaging their car. <laughs> there was there's, there's one guy that seemed to think he needed that smoke coming out of the back of his rear differential was okay. What I appreciated about him was his car, his first pass, he might have broken his car. Mm-hmm. And he realized that that nothing else was going to make it any worse. So he'll just keep – he was under no at, – at the end, he was under no pretenses that – his pretty, car was not broken. <laughs> pretty sure he went on the Black Hills Classic and kept going, too, if I remember right. So, <laughs> But what I was going to say was, I, don't you think we're going to have to have two classes for the Quick 60 next year? Hard to say. Not our, we're not our game. We're I just know, there to help. I know. But that, the new Corvette, it was – those are something this, else, aren't they? This, the C8s that were there. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was cool to see. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Here's a call that came in on the YouTube chat. 1994 C3500, 7.4, five-speed manual. What would cause it to idle too high at closed loop but not at open loop? When idling not moving, 
it idles right at 900 RPM. When moving at closed loop, it idles at about 1,200. ECM is still calling for 900. Doesn't matter if it's calling for EGR or EVAP purge. Cannot find vacuum leaks. There's got a, all that good stuff. He started off with a simple question and then proved then that he, he knows quite a bit. He's done he's that. stumped. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's probably been beating his head against a wall for a while going, why does it do this? That's from Tom on our YouTube feed. Oh, man. And it's a manual transmission. Could that have anything to do with it? If, it, if it's thinking is it what gear it's in? It doesn't or? know what gear it's in. It does know if the clutch is depressed or not. But it's idling at a higher. It's in closed loop. He's got it in gear. It's idling higher. Uh, but it's still calling. He says it's still calling for 900 RPM, but he's getting 12 out of it. So it should be giving you a code that says idle wrong, you know, too high of an, an idle for what's commanded. Yeah, it's an OBD-1 vehicle. And he's probably, if he's gone through all this and knows all that data, he's probably already put an idle control valve on the thing. Yeah, because if, if the computer's kind of saying one thing and you're not getting that, mm -hmm. then you kind of... Start, you start looking for a mechanical issue like that. You know, a, a cable, a throttle cable sticking could do that. You know, you might want to just disconnect the throttle cable. Disconnect and see if the it's old still, school cruise servo. Yeah. Just Maybe see that's if doing something funky. Up high. Uh, I would imagine with all that data you've given us, you probably already tried that. But if it's calling for 900, but it sees it's manually open, somebody's pulled on that lever. Uh, it's going to run at a higher. Look at your throttle position sensor voltage, too, because if it's calling for that idle, but it thinks that the throttle is cracked open a little bit, that you've stepped on the pedal, because the only sensor to the computer of where your foot is is the throttle position sensor. So if it's higher voltage than it's supposed to be, I think it's supposed to be around like 0 0.6063, somewhere in there, maybe even a little less. But if it thinks it's higher than that, if it's like 0 0.90 or 1 volt, then even though it's calling for that idle, when it's idling, it's saying, well, we're not idling, so we can be wherever we want, and we're not going to throw a code. It can get kind of tricky. It sounds like it. That car is almost 30 years old. That's weird. Because a 94, it doesn't sound like a 90, 94 sounds contemporary, mm -hmm. but it's not in any way, shape, or form, is it? Well, mine's, it's not even. Mine's almost that old, same Yeah, what years, what years, yours, Russ? 96. Yeah. 96 diesel. Yeah. Same body style, same looking truck. So we we just had a guy, Brent. We're seeing older and older and older vehicles come in all the time getting fixed because with less cars yeah, to buy, it. people are bringing. So this guy brings us a truck. He goes, oh, it's been sitting seven or eight years. It's a 95 7.4 or 5-speed dually truck. And it's not mint. It's nice, but not anywhere, you know, like mine. I mean, it's got... It doesn't have rust on it, but it's got dings and dents and scrapes and bends and, you know, seats Signs that are of life. worn. Yeah, but still, it's a truck that, you know, he had another one that was for sale. And he goes, well, I, I saw another one like this for sale, and it was $18,000. So, you know, I might as well just fix this one because I'm not going to be able to buy a, another one. You know, I've already got this. Why not spend the money to put a rebuilt engine in it? And people, just a couple years ago, it's six months ago, eight months ago. They were just like, I'm just going to scrap it. I bet, I bet we're now we're thinking, why did we have cash for clunkers? <laughs> we we, probably, we, we wouldn't have, back, yeah, we yeah. wouldn't, we wouldn't have this problem right now with a shortage of vehicles if we had the how many thousands were there? I, I don't remember the numbers. I, I really don't. It was more I, than a hundred thousand, oh, wasn't yeah, no, it, no, across it was, the country? It was way more than that. But I mean, it was still. We, we talked about it. it was a drop in the bucket. Yeah, it to, was. Yeah. You know, I, I, know, I know we did 1,700 of them. <laughs> I'd love to see 100,000 cars dropped on the market right now, huh? 866-594-4150. Let's go to Arizona and talk to Dan. Dan, you're on the End of the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hi. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. I I have, I listen to you guys occasionally and on the, a lot of, anyway, I have an 03 uh, Ford F-350. And my um, compass stopped working sometime back. And then all of a sudden it would come back and start working again. And it would bounce back and forth doing that. And then at one point, um, just to give you some insight to this, I had to have my right, um, uh, right hand side mirror replaced. 
And after that, it started bouncing in and out, and then it started working. Then it, now it just quit. And that, that's been a couple of years back that I had that mirror replaced. And I don't know if it was something when they replaced the mirror, if it, I don't know, something's not connected right. Uh, I've even tried, you know, I've gotten into my book and I've done circles out here. I've put in calculate. It's just not working. I just can't seem to. In other times, I'll turn the key on. It's almost like it activates, and then all of a sudden, it just goes off. That it's compass, that compass on that vehicle is up in the overhead console, correct? Yes, that is correct. And so it's a digital indicator that just says north, northeast, southeast as you're as you're pointing that yes. direction when it's working, correct? Yeah, yes, that is correct. See, on on the the GM stuff, which I'm more familiar with, they always house that sensor right in the mirror you know it was it was right in that area and the driver in the rear view mirror right it was part of that because you actually could buy kits from the mirror company to replace it and put a different mirror in there that had the compass function we, from we sold gentex we used to gentex. put a lot there of them there you go we, we sold a lot of them too yeah people people used to call us wanting a compass and temp and we put a lot of them in so i do know ford and others do some things where certain components get their sensor feed from another component where they mount it and i don't some of them put the temp sensor in the mirror exactly so i i don't know if there's a connection russ do you i think that i haven't done one on this Truck. We've never had one fail, but I think the all the electronics. I think it's all, are, up, the, I, I think it's all in that overhead console. In so the console it wouldn't be related to the mirror. I don't think so. Okay. I really don't. I think he's well, got a. Here's what makes you think. Go ahead. A, okay, one thing with you guys talking like that is I've never noticed anything, you know, like a little eyeball or any of that type of thing or some kind of a sensor, say, on the back side of the mirror that's you know facing outward, but. There is this little round dome on my dash up towards the, like where the defrost and stuff in between the defrost uh, vents. There's this little round dome that, that's no, sitting there. That's, thought, that's well, an ambient that's light. The... That, that's an ambient light sensor. Yeah, yeah. not related to that. That's the. Uh, yeah, your, uh, your compass. Turns on my headlights or. Right. right. Uh, the people that were wanting to put these mirrors and compasses in years ago back at about that time they would buy the whole overhead console and bolt them in and they would just work so it's it's got to everything's got to be right in that unit i think the compass is the temp sensor there. yeah yeah the temp sensor you'd be there if you want to add that you got to put that outside somewhere in a mirror or up front but yeah i think that was just like the chrysler everything's right up there in that overhead console as a self-contained unit i think it's just probably just a bad unit because many of those failed over the years in, in the Fords, but we just haven't done one in that model truck. On a related note, my son now, as a pilot, he he just thinks in degrees and compass headings, so he's wanted a compass for a while. So we have bought now four different compasses of varying price and varying levels of where you're getting it from, oh, this one's only 89 cents. It's going to take nine weeks to get here versus, you know, buying a good one at the... None of them have worked. One of them worked for like a day and then stopped working. So what What? I'm thinking is it might just be the earth. Dan, it might not be your truck. We might have a a bigger problem than that. So when you say these compasses you bought are not working, I've got to dig deeper here. Sorry, Dan. They don't point north. When I mean, How do you know you're looking north? Well, if they're all not working, magnetic north or true north, Chris. Hey, listen, I, you got to ask him about I, hold that. Hold on, I'm just There's saying. There's a difference. I'm familiar with compasses. I've seen comp- They don't hold their position. They, ter- I mean, just holding it, it doesn't. It will not hold a position of anything. One of them pointed directly west. It was showing that. <laughs> I mean, it just and the, we've had four of them now. So I just said I I can't get it. Tell them to drive your solstice. It always works, right? North, south, have, east, west? I don't have a compass on that. I don't. So. Is it broken? No, there's no compass. One the there's one no? on there. No, in there's the not. No. Oh, then, the, the, yeah, then, it's, switch on. then it's broken. I think, you, I think you have one with one of your, your selectors on your dash. Yeah. Pretty sure. Well, that's five compasses that don't work now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might just be, we might just be facing a shift. It might just be the whole. The magnetic field of the planet is moving. Me and moving Dan are regularly. having problems. Does Oscar have any problems when he's flying? No. They all nope. work? Yeah. 
and I've That's flown good. with them. Now I've fl- yeah, now I've flown with them, and I've I can verify that I've seen it. Just That's look at the ground perfect. and decide where you're at. Yeah, I just follow the interstate. That's what I said. I said I could fly. I ninety goes east and west. Yeah, go the other way. We're going the other one. <laughs> Dan, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. So, do you think that if he just, I mean, he's again, we're talking about an eighteen year old truck. Is that unit? You, they you can just get don't. those, right? There's an electronic right. glitch in that circuitry of that unit. That's about all that I think it can be. I, I would ditch the compass and get a navigation radio in the dash that tells you what direction you're going. Mine tells me what direction I'm going, and my truck's old, way older than his. So your your suggestion is just to, to find another compass, right? Yeah. I mean, there's no... There's a compass function on your iPhone or your, or your uh, Android. Mm-hmm. Works. I just look at the sun. I go, oh, it's 3 p.m. The sun's over there. I'm headed. I hold up a stick. North. I trace the shadow, and then I see how far it is, and then I can. I look at my compass. You look at the sundial. <laughs> There's no sun today. I hope We're going right. to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150 from the autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Randy in Oregon. Randy, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hi, I have I have a Chevrolet SSR 2005 that I bought brand new. I have 33,000 miles on it. And the gauges are getting wonky on me. About 200 miles ago, the um, um, temperature gauge, you know, when you turned on the gauges, all flip to the right, and then they settle in the right place. This one would just flip totally upside down, way past the the, um, um, heat and um, the too hot side. And I drove it for a few miles, I don't know, 50 or 100 like that, thinking, oh, I'm just driving a few feet, you know, a few miles here or there, not making any long trips. I should probably get the uh, radiator temperature gauge um, or or the um, temp thing changed. And I didn't do anything about it. And then uh, last week, all the gauges started going wonky, and none of them read correct. And then my speedometer started going crazy. And when I'm starting out, it says 22 miles an hour. So if I'm driving down my city street at 30, it says 50. And I don't know if I should be looking at fuses or a computer chip or what. Go ahead, Chris. What do you think? I think I'm, I have a question. If if this if Randy called in and said he had an 05 Silverado and the gauge on the I would stop him and say it's the cluster. Is that correlate to the right? I mean, the 05 GM clusters are a known. There's an era there where GM did not have good luck well, with their I, instrument clusters. I think it's cool that she's got this H that the, that she's got an SSR. This is. This is an SSR V8 LS2 drop top convertible, pickup right? Looking cool vehicle, correct? You bet. Why? It is the coolest car in the county. And that's why you that's, bought it, right? That's why I bought it. Yeah. That's I figure. I'm sorry about my voice. Getting over I'm your sorry cold. Sorry about my voice. I'm just getting over a cold, so it's really low and <laughs> it doesn't sound normal, but. That's all right. It yeah. is what it is. It's you got a cool car, so that makes up for it. I so I'm I'm almost positive the problem you're having with your car is your, um, your your instrument cluster itself, and now is the time to get it replaced, but while you can still read the mileage, so they can get an accurate reading and keep it factory because that's car is becoming worth more money by the day. That's exactly what I was saying. There's there's places you can send that cluster to to get it repaired and keep the mileage completely actual. Mm-hmm. Or if you get one from what – I doubt that's one that the remanufacturers are going to have a program for because no. it's just so, so low quantity of a And I want to rebuild the factory one just so I could say it's yeah. never been replaced. Yeah, and so, I mean, I know that in our market we've got a couple of people that 
that are kind of go-to people we can send those to. And I think if you ask around at your parts sure. stores, you can probably find that same thing. And so that you can get that factory okay. cluster fixed. All right. Now, so I just take it to an auto mechanic and they take it out? Well, I think what I would do first. That's what you're going to do, yeah, Randy. Yeah, yeah. But what I, what I would do first, and I don't know, this is just, I'm trying to think of the resources I would point the person towards. If you've got a parts store, you know, in your market that sells, you know, the parts of all over the place and they've been around for a while, they've probably got a connection to a rebuilder that you can send your cluster to. Now, because a Maybe. lot of them, what a lot of them have the manufacturers where they have the ready units, like Dorman, one of our partners, for most of these vehicles, they have a ready-to-go unit that the that the parts store can call in or the recycler or whoever's working with them. They contact them. They get the VIN number. They get the miles. They've got a, a bonded process to keep everything accurate, and then they send you another one with a core charge that's plug-and-play with the VIN number and everything already set up, and then you put it in and you send the core back. But that's not going to happen. I, you're here. not going to have that happen on this SSR. And so I think in my market, I know there's people that, I could, that we've met over the years that I could send this cluster to and get it repaired. And I know these people are out there in other parts I mean, of the in, country. In the worst case, if they won't do it for you out there, we'll call us back and you can have your mechanic ship it to us and we can have that done for you and ship it back. I mean, I don't know if we've ever said that on the show, but I but mean, that is a, the mechanic is those it. things can be done. The the mechanic is wherever you take your car. It will probably, have to be removed. From but the I mean, even wherever that car is going for service, they're probably going to have a rebuilder. They, they might work know, with, but right? I tell you what, we don't do that at our shop. Okay. Unless we had this situation, we are going to get the Dorman products rebuilt unit comes to us okay. quickly, pre-programmed. We send the core in. We're good to go because. But you know where we don't have you to. have a place that. We do. Okay. We do know of a place. But the reason we know of a place is because we've got this auto recycler that okay. does hundreds of speedometers a year uh, in one form or another and other electronics where we've had to come up with other ways. Okay. If we were just a shop, we have might not have, never might had not to know. go and, and here's the thing. That. You're going to have to bring it to somebody, I believe, and just confirm what that's we think what is right. That's what the problem right. is. Confirm <laughs> that. How terrible would it be if that's not it? Right. But you confirm <laughs> looking at the scanner data to see, yep. The computer's telling it all the right yeah, stuff. Yeah, speedometer says 15 miles an hour. Uh, you know, the computer says 15 and the speedometer's at 35. Uh, something's wrong. It says 210 degrees and the gauge is all the way over on hot or all the way on cold. Something, yeah, something's wrong. And I would, I would encourage right. you also to check just to make sure with your uh, Chevy dealer and see what, how their program works if they have that available yet. Um, you might be pleasantly surprised that it's not as as expensive as one would think, but you want to understand with that type of vehicle, how does that mileage work? Uh, do they send you a unit with zero miles and you got to put a sticker on the door that says the odometer was changed, or do they come back and let you program it to what your mileage was? I got one from Chevrolet Monday, this last Monday, and it said this unit, it's it was a rebuilt, but it said this unit has not been programmed, must be connected to SPS Tech 2 and programmed with your mileage warning. You can only program mileage once. So it came as zero. You put the mileage in it to be 100% accurate. You bolt it in. Okay. That may still be available for that vehicle, but it was definitely, it had a tag on it. And I don't, usually they don't give away their sources, but it had a, it had a phone number and a tag of this company that was rebuilding them under the wrap from GM. So they obviously didn't care, but. They were sending in these parts to have them gone through and wiped out, cleaned, and off the, they went. Does that uh, help you out there, Randy? Hey, this SSR, I, it's got to be oh. it's, it's got to be yellow. What do you think, Chris? It is yellow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just every SSR in my mind, I imagine them yellow. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's my favorite color, but I know there's plenty of red ones, blue, purplish color ones I've seen. Black, white. Yeah. They're, um, but they are pretty cool, and they're getting the prices just going up on those. Like you want to keep that mileage accurate, Randy. Thanks very much for the call. Good luck. I have to say, I saw an SSR recently, and this has changed over the years. But I have to say that when I saw it the other day, I was delighted, and I I smiled, and I thought it was great. And I don't think I've. I can say I haven't always felt that about the SSR, yeah, but yeah, that's fair. I thought it. That's fair. It, it just looked. So fun. It just looked like they were having a good time. And 
866-594-4150. Let's go to Louisiana and talk to Jeff. You're on the end of the hood show. Jeff, what can we do for you? Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my call. You bet. Hey, I've got, I've got a uh, 16. My wife has a 16 Tahoe. I've got a 15 Silverado. Same transmission. And a uh, funny story, I went to the transmission filter on her. I saw that transmission filter fits into the housing. There's a little glass oh. ring. Jeff, hold on a second. Your phone is sounding weird there. If you can, if you're moving hey, it around. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yeah, go can ahead. Start, start over again All with right, the question, right, would you please? All right. So I've got a two thousand my wife has a two thousand sixteen Tahoe. I've got a fifteen Silverado. Both have the same transmission. So I went to go change the fluid and filter on my wife's Tahoe and right where the transmission filter fits into the housing, there's a little like, brass ring with a gasket on it. Um took a look at it and I was like, you know, that looks like something I might have trouble getting out. I didn't change it on her. When I did mine, I was like, Well, I've got my extra from hers. And I got a spare, so surely I could get it out, and I couldn't get it out. <laughs> and I had to get it towed into the dealership. Every time I tried to, to – oh, I got it out. I couldn't get it in without bending it. I tried to hit it in with a little wooden dowel. I was just curious if there's a special tool or something to remove that thing or even if it's even necessary to do. A lot of people don't change them. Most of the time they just pull the filter out, and if it fits tight and there's no leakage there, they just leave the one in there that was in there. If there's any damage to it, if it doesn't sit right, or if it falls out when you pull that filter out, you've got to change it. Uh, but, yeah, you're, you're right. Most people don't. And even on the older transmissions that had the little seal pounded into them, they just, a lot of people didn't change them. The, the biggest problem that people have is when they stick a, a hook or pick or something in there to pull it out, and they scratch the side of the, the valve body or the pump, the pump housing there. When they do that, well, it, it leaves a, an air gap. So now you put the seal in, it's got an air gap down the side where they gouged it, and that's worse than the other direction. So I'd probably just leave it as long as it fits tight, and it, it should. Is there the have you any problems with leaving it in there that, that you know of? I've, you know, I've, no. I don't think I've ever seen one leak or have okay. a problem as long as somebody hadn't tried to pull it out and damage the, right. the housing. I think you yeah, should I just, right. It's coming up time to do my, my wife's again, and the last thing I want is to mess hers up. <laughs> I'd rather mess mine up. Than- <laughs> yeah, yeah you've got to be careful with that. Jeff, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the End of the Hood Show. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. 866-594-4150. Prepare to learn something. You're going under the hood. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Chris. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Chris, what can we do for you? Hey, how are we doing today, guys? Fantastic. Wonderful. Thanks for asking. Hey, I got a 99 Silverado with a 5.3, and I guess I'm having some problems on startup initially. Um, startup, it's run rough idle sounds like it's missing just terrible um once in a while you leave it here like a pop like it's backfired underneath the hood but then you drive it for a minute it levels off purrs like a kitten the rest of the time no problems at all but then you go into like say the store come back out start it up problem all over again but then in a minute it's gone runs great i guess i'm wondering what i should look at there i've kind of i've done a tune up you know, spark plugs and all that stuff, but uh, I don't really want to just start throwing parts at something. <laughs> pull That's old enough. What, pull, your, what? pull your fuel pressure regulator line off. There's a vacuum hose connected to the fuel pressure regulator and a driver's side fuel rail. Look at the driver's side fuel injectors, and you're going to see a little round silver golf ball size part with a vacuum line on it. It's the only vacuum line on top of the engine there. Unplug that. When it's, you know, go to the end of the store, let it sit for 20 minutes, come back out and just just grab a hold of it and pull it off. If it's wet in there, that fuel pressure regulator is leaking, causing it to flood out. So when you start it, it's not okay. starting easy. And that, I mean, that's a, a maintenance item. They're Pretty common problem in that 10 era. years, they'll go bad. Yeah, and it's super easy to change at home in the driveway. Uh, it's best to wait, let it sit overnight so the pressure bleeds off a little bit because it's going to if it's leaking. Uh, before you pull it out. Otherwise, you're going to get fuel shooting out of there and you want it cold when you do it. But it can be swapped out and 
a minute, maybe two minutes. If you know, if <laughs> pretty easy to change, but that could be doing it. The oh, other I thing, like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other thing that could be doing it. I hate to say it, but on the '99 model, could be a head gasket. Oh no! To don't tell him that. It's not awful on that. Tra- I'd rather do a head gasket on one of those than a older okay, three fifty Chevy. Okay, in that Chevy. scenario, when yeah, he, you when, would when he changed his when he changed his spark plugs, though he should have noticed something probably on the plugs if if he was getting some probably not intrusion. No, it's just going to be a little. It's so small that it's going to be a, a tiny amount in a cylinder. Um, you know, you could a head gasket will fix it. Case some case seal would fix it too and stop it if it's a small, tiny little crack. But he could do that. an exhaust gas check too at the radiator and see if he's oh, got any hydrocarbons should, showing up. That should be a sign of that if that's what's going on. But hey, yeah, you know, I'm I'm leaning towards that fuel pressure regulator to, as a first place that's to start looking. How much is a new? Probably twenty five bucks. Oh yeah, that's that's what you want, Chris. Okay, yeah, I don't know if it matters or not. It's only got like 140,000 on it. It's been doing it since I've got it yeah. for the last 20,000 miles or so. Yeah, that could definitely be but, a fuel uh, pressure regulator. And if, Chris, if you're like me, you're going to take that fuel pressure regulator off. And if it's dry, you're going to go, well, it's not completely dry. I think it's, yeah, it I looks think a little wet. Yeah, I bet I, it, it's probably this still. It, if, if, you, if you're going <laughs> to, if you're going to throw part starts, that'd be cheap darts well, to throw. That's and a, a 99, one. if you're putting a set of spark plugs in a vehicle, just put a fuel pressure regulator in there because it's super cheap, super easy to do and be done with it. And then it won't fail because if it fails, it's going to fail at the worst time for you. And right. Be hard to start, affect your fuel mileage, all that stuff. Have you ever, I've you ever had a car not start when it's perfect? When you're like, oh, great, this is a great time for it to not start. No, it's never when it happens, yeah. right? I've had very few cars ever leave me where I could not find a way to get it going again and get me back home. No, if, or drive 180 if, miles in if, second gear. I've come up with things. <laughs> if you're Russ or Jake at the shop and a customer's having a problem and you pull the car in, everything's working good, and then you go to start it again and it won't start, that would be a perfect time for that, that is, car not to start. <laughs> that is the time. That would be no, because then they blame it on you. What did you do? No, it's but like they're there because it won't start. Right. I'm telling you. They tell you, and you say, oh, it just well, doesn't we got to see. Uh, and then you pull it in the shop and it starts. Well, we, we had have, a guy, we've been working on this truck, he, so we found it was the, the fuse box in this old Silverado was covered in mouse droppings. It was disgusting. It was corroded. It wouldn't shift. It wouldn't start. So we put a fuse box in it and it starts. Well, then about uh, two weeks later, he goes, well, you know, it's acting up again. Well, now it's working. I'll bring it in. So he brings it in. It's up at our shop for a month and a half. You probably saw it sitting on the end, Shannon, an old black one. It's like, it's sitting yeah. there. It's like, it starts. It starts every day. So finally I gave up and I said, you know, it starts every day. I'm just going to let it sit. So we did some tire swapping on it and it, it had sat for three weeks before we swapped tires, and it fired right up, and it's cold, so it's got a great battery. Fired right up, sat again for another few weeks, and he's like, I'm kind of bummed because the thing still is not starting. Well, I'm just going to take it. Well, he went and turned the key, and it started right up. I'm like, and you're saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we get those a lot where it's like, oh, it, it never starts. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Gary. You're on the end of the hood show. Gary, what can we do for you? Yeah, I've got a remote start on my Honda Pilot 2012, and I found a fuse that was bad, and I've replaced the fuse in it, but it still will not uh, automatically start when I push the button. Is this a factory remote start, or is it an aftermarket one? Yeah, I believe it's an aftermarket one. Because that 12 would have been pretty early to have a factory one, but... Because just for people with factory remote starts, just something we like to remind them that you can have any of a number trouble codes in your computer, any. and it will cancel the remote start from working. Because it just it's it's okay. saying okay. It, it's saying you know what we're not sure what's going on here. We've got a code. We don't want to start this thing when somebody's not looking at it or standing there. And so that that's just part of the programming on some of the factory remote starts. And it could be any. Code. The aftermarket remote starts, on the other hand, seldom have anything like that. Some of them have a hood switch, and if somebody yeah, installed the hood switch and it's broken, that could do it, but that's super rare. But I mean, as far as, like, the, the, the codes in the computer or anything like that, it that. doesn't care. It's it just trying to start that vehicle. It's just going to crank it. Low voltage might be something it might stop it from if it because yep. they read voltage in a lot of them. But Valet mode, if it's stuck. Do, do the door locks work with the remote for the remote start? Yes. Okay. Then it could be stuck in valet mode, 
So you're going to have to find out what kind of a remote starter it is, get a manual for it, and then find out. And those manuals are available online. You can oh, find yeah, them. just type in online and type the brand in the model number, and it should pop up. But just try it. If it's in valet mode, the door locks will work, but it won't start. And that's very possible that that's happened. If you had a blown fuse or you removed a fuse and put it back in, sometimes it'll go right into valet That's mode. what I was just going to say is that when you're dealing with those, the settings sometimes switch on you for mm. whatever reason, and you're, you're unaware of that. Can you can you f- see what brand it is by the remote itself, or do you know? I My wife has it. I don't have it on me. Check, uh, check that at, out. At, look at the moment, so. Yeah, usually the remote okay, will yeah, have the brand checked name. Yeah, I online at night. I haven't found a lot to it uh, for a manual for this particular brand. It could be the El Cheapo brand. There's a few of those running around out there, and if it is, there's some of these companies that came and went. They're kind of fly by night, and they just didn't make it very long. If it's one of those really super, super cheap ones, most of the time the best fix for that is just go to a stereo shop that works on them and have it removed and Gary, are there any uh, toggle switches randomly placed around the vehicle? That's what my first van had. We had under a, the dash. Yeah, we had a remote start that never worked, and there was just a little toggle switch hidden under the dash that was flipped to off. I know the the <laughs> systems down there. That's where I found the where the the brains and everything is. If it's still it's a two, the antenna that 2012 model year remote start, and it was a basic one in 2012. Your wife would be absolutely lovey huggy of you if you got her one of the new modern ones. About ten times the range. Oh, yeah. it's just the yeah. way they work, and even if you go to the next step and you get one that's uh, phone based, um, you know, Russ and I have got the drone is the brand we've got, and ours from we have a good friend of ours, Audio Playground here in Sioux Falls, sells and installs them, but they are so nice um, as far as the way you can use it, the feedback, the the range. Um, basically, you could be. Landing on a plane, and when they start tell you it's safe car, yeah. to use your vehicle, your your cellular device, and you can log in and start your start your vehicle in the parking lot. Well, <laughs> and two, going back to being an aftermarket, and if it's a little bit on the low range of quality, and depending on where it was put in, all that stuff, there's a lot of wires there too that can get corroded mm-hmm. or just. I mean. You, the way it was installed, it could have just been routed in a weird place. Some a lot installers of use those, you know, a lot of them use the push clips that just kind of squeeze over the, the factory T-taps. wire. T-taps. and they're not always T-tapped in all the right. way. So, yeah, <laughs> it could be a couple things there. That's the only bad thing here is it's mm-hmm. not just a simple thing. It might be. It might be as easily as programming it. But Gary, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us. Before we leave here, I have a question. You know the chip thing? Oh, go ahead. Well, we got one one last thing, too. We got to give away a hoodie to Dave Killingsley from Atwood, Indiana. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. The place to go when you want to learn the ways of the automotive technician. Did I miss that earlier? No, we had a call. We wanted to oh, yeah. talk to. We were going to get back to it. So, so no time to get your chip thing in now? No, nah, never yeah, mind. Got 30 seconds. I had a big idea. No, that's... Uh, we're we'll, going to make chips. We'll do it off air. Potato and then chips, we'll make, corn we'll chips. Make, we'll finally make our millions. This will be right. fine. This will work out Don't just give fine. It away. That'll do it for this hour of the Under the Hood Show. The Under the Hood Show is brought to you by Sturt Events. Until next time, you can find us at underthehoodshow.com. For Russ Evans, Shannon Nordstrom, I'm Chris Carter. Thanks for listening to the Under the Hood Show.